Welcome to Hey Sister. This is season two, episode six. Ready, aim, mother. Moving the family forward. Hey, sister. Hey, sister. Thanks for joining us. I'm Courtney Lewis. And I'm Carly Ferguson. Welcome to our sisterly phone call inspired podcast. Hop on our calls each week as we interview qualified guest experts and discuss the meaningful and sometimes mundane aspects of our lives. We're so excited to connect with you, sister. Let's get talking. Hello, sisters. It's good to be with y'all today. I'm Carly Ferguson, and my sister Courtney and I are so excited to jump into today's topic of a mother's role with understanding and establishing our missions as individuals and as a family unit. Today's episode and all of our episodes this month focus on the connections we make and strengthen within the role of motherhood. As y'all heard us talk about last month, this season, our overarching theme is connection, and every month we will focus on a different connection point. So with it being May, the month we celebrate mothers, It just felt right to talk about important connections within our family. Looking back in April, our theme was connection preparation. So we invite y'all to go check those episodes out if you want a great primer course on emotional health, listening skills, unhealthy relationship habits, and connecting yourself with God. Lots of great info there to prepare us for all season two has in store. You can find any of those episodes in the show notes or at heysisterpodcast.org. Now, Courtney, our sisters have waited long enough. Why don't you introduce our world-renowned parenting guest expert? Of course. It is my pleasure to introduce our sisterhood to the incredible Nicolene Peck. Nicolene is a worldwide phenomenon and leader, and for good reason. Her proven parenting system, based upon calmness, the principles of self-government, and good communication, transforms even the most out-of-control teenagers and homes from chaos to calm within days. The world witnessed this in 2009 when the Peck family was featured on a one-hour BBC documentary about parenting, where two troubled British teens came to stay in their home for eight days. After two days, the teens stopped rebelling and by the end of the program begged not to leave the Peck family. She has appeared on various news shows and radio programs to discuss effective parenting. She's a popular public speaker, author of the international book, Parenting, A House United, and many other books, as well as the founder of Teaching Self-Government. I actually recently discovered Nicolene's work after two different friends who don't know each other both recommended her book, Parenting a House United, within days of one another. I had been praying for resources to guide me in my parenting journey, and boom, it was delivered. Ask and ye shall receive, right? Well, as y'all know, I have never been a book person, a trait I'm not proud of and am working to remedy. So when I say I can't stop reading a book, you know it's got to be good. (laughs) Nicolene's book is 100% helping me in the process of trying to become a bookworm because I cannot put it down. Between the audiobook I listen and re-listen to and the hard copy book I continue to highlight to high heaven, I am convinced her work is inspired and exactly what my family needs. I know you will all love what we have asked her to talk about today, which is just a small snippet into her amazing work. Can you tell I'm fangirling a little bit here? Enough from me. Nicolene, welcome to Hey Sister. Well, I'm happy to be here, Courtney and Carly. Thanks for having me. Why don't we just start off, Nicolene, by letting you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. You know what I usually tell people is I usually tell people that I am just a mom, a mom who was minding her own business, trying to be the best mom that I could be when suddenly my life changed in front of my eyes and I I didn't even know where it was going and it happened so fast. So... Years ago, I was a career woman and I worked super, super hard to get home so that I could spend a lot of time with my babies when they were little. And then my husband changed careers right as I got a new house and out of the office. And this was a time where he was going to have to go back to school and everything. And so I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? And I took it to God. What am I going to do? And I got this answer you know what, you can bring in troubled teens into your home because I'd gone into schooling, doing special education and stuff like that. And so I felt like, okay, this is something I'm probably up for. So I did therapeutic treatment care for troubled teens for a lot of years in my home. 
And then after that, people started asking me to speak about it. And then in 2009, they asked me to make the documentary of the world's strictest parents about it. And then people started asking me to write books when I didn't think I was going to be an author. You said you didn't think you were a reader. Well, I didn't think I was an author. And now I've written (laughs) 11 books. You know, I'm like, what's going on? Anyway, and I've spoken all over the world, trained people of all different faiths, which is super humbling to see how many people are focusing on strengthening the family around the world. And then also heads of state, heads of countries asking me to come to their countries to speak and to train people there as well. Truly, it is the most humbling humbling experience. I feel so honored to help families. And that's what I do. I'm just wearing out my life now, helping families try to become the best that they could be. Because when the world falls apart, we all look at what is closest to us and it is the family. And if we can put that family together, then guess what? We actually have the power to make the world a better place, even if we can't control all the junk that's going on around us. Well, you are helping families and These two families represented here by Courtney and I (laughs) included. Courtney mentioned that she had started reading your book about self-government. Could you explain the term self-government and give a brief overview of your book? Yeah, sure. So the book is not a lightweight, as Courtney (laughs) mentioned. So if you're looking for a brief start, first read Popular Parenting Methods. You can read that in about an hour. Then read the roles. You can read that in about two and a half hours. And then when you really want all the skills, then you get into Parenting a House United. And it's going to take you a little bit of time. But there is the audio. So that's good. Anyway, so self-government. The whole book looks through the lens of self-government. In fact, everything I do at teachingselfgovernment.com and on all my work on YouTube and everywhere else is all about self-government. So we got to know what that is. So self-government is being able to determine the cause and effect of any given situation and possessing a knowledge of your own behaviors so that you can control them. So what that means is that you understand cause and effect as it relates to your own behaviors, as it relates to your heart, your condition of heart, your thoughts that you have about things. And then you analyze yourself regularly and you determine what path forward you will take. Now, let me tell you how you know if you will hit your mark on that path forward. So when a person is self-governed, they say, who ought I to be? What type of a person ought I to be? And then they align their want with their ought, kind of like shooting a gun. I shoot guns. Our family has lots of guns. And you align that front sight in with the back sight. So the back sight, the one that looks like a you, is the ought. That's who you know you ought to be. And usually that comes from a higher source than yourself because it's a better version than anyone on TV has come up with. And then there's that front sight, which is the want. And that want, you put it in that ought frame. And then you aim there. You decide to align your wants with who you ought to be. And then you course correct all along the way. Now, when a person is self-governed, this does not mean they are perfect. And I think it's really important for people to understand that. Because I think some people probably think, well, Nicolene Peck must be perfect. Or "Ah, nobody's perfect. That Nicolene Peck must be making stuff up. Or, nope, Nicolene Peck's not perfect. Nicolene Peck has been aligning her want with her aunt for years and years. And she's been course correcting day after day after day. And that's what life is all about for everybody. But it's the people who know that this is a powerful, deliberate process that leads a person forward all the time. Those are the lucky ones. The ones that just accidentally course correct from time to time, they don't get very far. That is how a person aims themselves in a really powerful direction, the direction of self-government. And that self-government is actually a recipe for freedom. So to answer your second question, Carly, about the book. So the book talks about the family relationships. It talks about the power of self-government for the individual. It talks about creating an environment where parents and children can both be self-governing. I talk about the principles of self-government, but we take it further than that. And I even give you the skills of self-government, which are based on all of the principles. So we share four basic skills, like how to follow instructions, accept no answers, accept consequences, disagree appropriately. We know adults that can't even do that, right? Like these are adult skills, but we can start teaching them to children when they're teeny tiny, which is amazing. And I taught all of my foster children, as well as my children, all of these skills, and they've been tested all around the world. They work amazing. But then I also teach parents the skills that they need to fix the problems in a way that it's calm 
and it's mm-hmm. unifying so that you can be connected to your children when you're correcting them. I think a lot of people think that correcting a child has to be a negative thing. And I say, why? Why does it? Why does it have to be a negative thing? That's each person living their role. I have a whole book all about roles. Each person is living their role. Why would that ever be a bad thing? The mm-hmm. parents teaching, the parents nurturing and correcting, and the child is learning and they're a learner. Why would that ever be a bad thing? That should be a good thing, a healthy thing, even a happy and a healing thing. And correcting can feel like that for families. So I help them get to that place. And we talk about other things too, like technology stuff and all the sexual things in this world and all those things that are attacking our families and our children. And really, I give an amazing manual for what you can do to create a cultural revolution in your house so that you don't have to get sucked into the culture around us that is feeding us a bunch of distracted chaos, really. Right. I know. And that's why we did give that title of Ready Aim, because there's so much that we need to work on ourselves with learning to practice self-governance within ourselves and be able to bring ourselves to that state of calm, be able to instruct our children and how that they can bring themselves into that state and know how to take no answers and do these things that are skills that we need to learn in life. Once we learn those things, we're really happier people. We're able to take those changes that come in life. And like you said, course correct. And it all stems from being able to aim ourselves, the ought and the want. I love that analogy. That's just beautiful. It really is. And hearing everything you're saying, Nicolina, I just could talk to you about any of those comments that you were making along the way. I just kept having all these little light bulb moments as you're speaking. And it's true what you're saying about why do people think that criticism has to be such a negative thing? Because I have definitely found in the last few months that I'm having more connection with my kids through those moments of criticism. And Mm -hmm. they love the moments of praise. Of course, like when they do the chore that they were told to do. And I say, here's a high five. And this is what you did so well. And look how responsible you are that you did something you didn't want to do, but you did it. And we get to celebrate that they're happy, but really we have great bonding moments. If there's actually a criticism that comes in and we get to, after the criticism, sit down and just enjoy one another's company and our hearts are more knit together. And that's really what we wanted to have you on to talk about today was this whole process of uniting the mother's heart with the child and getting on the same page as far as a family vision and a family mission. And I know before this podcast started, you talked to us a little bit about the difference. And today we want you to talk about the family mission, but I know that those two are very intertwined. So could you talk to us a little bit about what a family mission is, what a family vision is? I know it's at the very beginning of the Parenting a House United book, which is like you said, it's a hefty book, but it's wonderful. So I love that part of the beginning of the book though, because I do think that's necessary to understand before you launch into trying to teach these four basic skills. For sure. And really each person that's going to be going forward anywhere, okay, you're going to start a business, you're going to start a family, you're going to start anything. You have a picture in mind of what you want to accomplish. Okay. And that's your vision. That gives you a reason why you are going to continually move forward again and again. Did you know that parents, they have all this time, they have nine months to think very conscious, logical thoughts about what they want their family to be like, what they hope their relationships are like, all these kinds of things. They prepare for this child and they even think, how many children do we maybe want to have? And all of this kind of stuff. The baby is not thinking anything like that in the womb. And so here's the baby. The baby comes, lives day to day. We take care of things. Baby cries. Baby learns to tell us things, talk things. But still, do you know how many families never explain to the child why they are a family and where they are going. They never take that time. It's just one deliberate conversation that you can have with your child. And if you're wise, you take that one deliberate conversation and you have it again and again. Now, let me tell you something about mother, okay? Mother is the heart and hearthstone of the family. This is important. She holds the strings to her children's hearts. This is part of her role. Now, this would be something in my roles book, so different book that we're talking about here. But she is the heart and hearthstone. She can guide them. She can guide their morals, their values. She can make them love daddy or hate daddy. Okay. Mm -hmm. She really can. The children will tattletale on daddy to mom. They will. There is a period of time where mama has them all to herself because mama is the prime authority. No matter what, they want to please mama and they want to learn from mama. And so 
mom gets to decide where the family is headed. Now that doesn't mean dad doesn't have any say, of course, but mom has a big role in that. And then as the children get a little bit older, daddy actually starts to have more influence with the children, especially when they hit about age 12. And then the children can be pointed away from mommy. So if daddy's smart, he points them back toward mom. Because if he doesn't, things could get all messed up because children go to mom for wisdom and daddy for acceptance. And so if daddy doesn't point them back toward wisdom, they could pull away from all of that learning of their youth. So fathers have the ability to either show acceptance for everything that mother has taught or to corrupt the child later in life. Wow. So anyway, yeah, people do not understand this. Anyway, so when we're talking about a family vision, so this is the picture, an image of what the family wants to become, how they want to bond with each other, what they want their relationships to feel like and be like. And I talk in my book, Parenting and House United, about how to make a 20-year vision or a 10-year vision. So this picture of the future of who you want to become, this is powerful. If mommy and daddy are holding on to this, then hopefully they will support each other's roles the whole time. Now, I know there's some homes, and I don't want anybody to get frustrated. I know there's some homes where mommy and daddy are not on the same page in their parenting, or sometimes it even feels like they're not on their same page about what they want for the family. Because sometimes there's maybe one parent that's a little bit more selfish and it's just like, I'm not changing anything, which means they don't want self-government. A self-governed person wants to change themselves all the time to do better, better, better. If somebody doesn't want that, that could mean they don't want self-government yet. And I'm going to say yet, because after doing this for years and years, well over 20 years now, I have seen many husbands, usually husbands, but sometimes wives, but many husbands say, I'm not interested. I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in changing anything about my language, my way, my yelling, my hitting, my whatever. Okay. I'm not interested. And then they see the mother have a different relationship with the children. And then suddenly something happens in the heart of the person because they're around truth and they change. And my husband was actually even one of those husbands. So there's a piece of information that a lot of people don't know. They think, oh, she probably came from perfect parents and has this husband who's like amazing. And he is amazing. I will give him that. He does laundry. He cooks. He does. I mean, and so do I. We all, we do everything. We're pulling together equal yoke all the time. But I'll tell you what, there was like two years of my life where he was like out. He was not going to do any of it. And he was hoping it would go away. And it didn't go away because I did it for me because I had a responsibility to God for how I was going to raise my children when it was on my terms, when it was on my watch. I couldn't blame him for messing up my children. So I did it and proof was in the pudding and then he changed. So it happens. So vision is vital, but the children need to know it too, where they're going and why. So creating that picture of the future. Now the mission is different. The vision is the why. The mission is the how. It's how are we going to get there? Now I've talked about skills and we teach skills and good communication. This is all part of the how, but the mission is this statement where you articulate exactly how you will get to that vision or that picture of that family that you want to become. And mission is a concept that I think people stab at all the time, but they don't completely understand. So you can have a personal mission. You can have a family mission mission. You can have a community mission. You can have a national mission. You can have a religious mission with other people of your faith. There are a lot of different missions that a person could end up finding themselves part of. That mission is this feeling of living your ultimate purpose, your purpose. Why are you here? So I'm not Buddhist, but Buddha said that the purpose in life is to find your purpose in life and then do it. I like that. I love it. Isn't that what everybody's looking for? I mean, I'm guessing, ladies, that you're doing this podcast because you actually feel something down deep like you have to. Exactly. Yeah. It's part of your mission. But there are other missions. There's this parent mission and this personal mission, and they are slightly different from each other. So understanding what a mission is, is probably step number one. And then understanding the power of that parent mission is something that I think everybody needs to understand because many people pass that parent mission right by and they miss their greatest way to impact the world for good. 
I totally agree. I think it's so easy to get caught up in the world and you go on the defense for parenting. It's just a constant defense game. You're trying to constantly come up with creative ways to punish your kids. You're trying to constantly absorb any media you can for what are the best ways I can get my kid to sleep through the night or what can I buy? What can I do to like fix this problem? And you're not proactively trying to figure out how I can be a better parent. So I love everything that you're talking about. And I can't wait to dive deeper to talk about this because I do think taking the time to understand what is a mission and what is your purpose. That's so vital. I really like how earlier you referred to children as little learners or they're learners. And I think we all are. And as you talked about having that sit down conversation, like explaining it to them, why are you here? Like the roles of the family and that purpose. So much of parenting is that instruction. And if we're not given the vocabulary to articulate the idea, like, so my oldest is five or he's going to be five soon. And it's amazing when we're able to teach a word, have them repeat the word and how much better they can remember that word later. But it just takes reiteration (laughs) of it. And then they do so much better. And like Courtney was saying, sometimes it can get easy to be passive in parenting, you talked about having these nine months to be conscious about what you want to do and how you want to parent and these things. And I feel like I was gung ho for all those things. I hadn't yet found the material you have that's so wonderful, but I read books and I was trying to absorb all this information and I had my first and then 18 months later (laughs) had my next and then 18 months later had my next. And I feel grateful that my husband, we're equally yoked. We feel very much united in parenting, but there are times where we're like, okay, what do we do? You feel like you're coming up on the exit real fast. You're like, is this the one, you know, and you need to be a little bit more premeditated and have your wits about you because kids can quickly take it away because they are learning themselves. They're not yet at the stage where they can have a conversation about something and They don't know what's going on. And once you kind of get to that point where you're like, oh, you don't know what's happening here. I'm all upset. But like in your mind, there's no food and you are starving and it is DEFCON 4 (laughs) going on. So that helps to have a mission too, as you said, to articulate those things, because we all need those how to statements and things that can be digestible. (laughs) They remind us where we're going. They remind us this is what we need to focus Mm -hmm. on and where we're headed. And I think, Carly, you hit something right on the head. And that is that parenting is crazy. I mean, it is crazy. And these children just keep coming. And there gets to be a point where you go, okay, am I in constant chaos? Is everyone in constant crisis? Because it always is the food, the crisis, the diaper, the crisis, the lost shoe, the crisis, they get to the appointment, the crisis. It's like everything feels that way. And I think it's really easy for a person to forget what it's all about. Mm -hmm. To forget all that dreaming that they had for that first baby. To forget where they wanted to head and what type of relationships they wanted. They just want to get to the end of the day. They think it's pinball where you're just... (laughs) Uh, sporadically <laughs> bouncing until you hit your goal, you know? <laughs> exactly. But then that's where like Courtney was saying, but then we end up reactive. Mm-hmm. So then we're reactive instead of proactive. And so just remembering that the proactive side of the parenting is always going to be the power side. That's the calm side, the peace side, the confidence side. That's the teaching side. That's the power side. The reactive side of the parenting is always going to be the stress side, the I don't have enough side, the excuses side. It's always going to be the empty side and the non-connective side. So when you're on the proactive side, you're focusing on connecting your whole way through. When you go reactive because you don't have the proactive pieces in place, then everything changes. And so this family vision and the family mission statement are proactive things that a family does to try to maintain the course. And there are other things we do that we, boy, we can't talk about all of them today. It would just take way too long. But like family meetings that we have, 
and planning sessions that I call parent counseling sessions and some of the other pre-teaching that we do. There's so many things that I teach in my system that help people so much. But let's just talk about quickly about a mission because I know we really want to hit on that so that parents cannot feel like they are aiming nowhere because they're running after the children all of the time. They need to see themselves as leaders. They need to magnify the roles that they have. They need to make sure that they can maintain that calmness and confidence so that they know where they're headed. So knowing where you're headed is huge. Okay. So a mission, a mission, like I said, is this feeling of your purpose. Why are you here? Why do you have this capacity? So there are only eight personal missions that a person could have. Now I'm going to list these personal missions for you. They are listed in the book, Parenting at House United, so you can find them there. But here are the eight. They are feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, healing the sick, comforting the lonely, teaching the ignorant, liberating the captives, creating beauty, and preaching the gospel. So one of those would stick out to you. If you read them through again, you're like, hmm, which one's me? Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, heal the sick, comfort the lonely, teach the ignorant, liberate the captives, create beauty, and preach the gospel. What one is me? When I first went through those, I realized my personal is liberate the captives. I do all of this. All of it is mission for me. It's ministry. I don't even take pay from it. That doesn't mean I don't get money that comes in from the books or the trainings that I do. I use those to pay other people to run the business side of things so that I can still focus on being the mama and the grandma that I want to be. And so I can still weed my garden and stuff. Because to me, that's actually way more important than money. And my husband, he provides for my family. So anyway, this is mission for me and it's liberate the captives. So that means that I am going to help free people. I don't see parents as ignorant necessarily, even though they don't know what they don't know. They're just captive by old habits, by how they were raised, by what's going on in society. And because they don't know what they don't know, they're captive. And so I help them to become free from emotional bondage and all of these habits that get in the way. So one of those things is going to stick out to a person for a personal mission. But here's the coolest thing for a parent. A parent is all eight of those missions. A parent is the mission of all missions because it is all eight. People come to me all the time and they're like, Nicolene, how do I do stuff like you? I want to write books. I want to do this. And I'm like, well, that's great that you want to. And you're feeling a desire to do something like that. I never wanted to do any of it. Just to be honest, I just wanted to be the parent and look what happened to me. That's where I'm at. I wanted to do that mission of all missions the very, very best I could. And I focused so hard on all of that. And then there came a point where God saw fit that I had to do something else and then something else and then something else. And that's how mission works, I've noticed. For the people that are the most powerful in their missions, the ones that are the most authentic, they are mission people all the way through. Not just for a business or for a fad or for a stage. They are mission all the way through, down to their core. They don't do stuff just for themselves. If you're just serving yourself, it is not a mission. It is employment and it is looking for an opportunity. That is not a mission. A mission is when you give your whole self to something greater than you to benefit other people. That's what a mission is. Anyway, so parenting is that. It's day in, day out. Now, here's the thing. Why do people feel like being a parent is like the worst thing and they can't get away from it? When it is the mission of all missions. And I think it's because nobody ever tells them it's the mission of all missions. People Mm -hmm. give these messages like, it's got to be awful all the time. And oh, can't you wait until they go to school? Can't you wait until they leave the house? Can't you wait till the... Whoa, we should not be giving those messages. Can't you wait to read them a story? Can't you wait to make them cookies? Can't you wait until you sit there and fold the laundry together and talk about your life growing up? Can't you wait until you run through the sprinklers? Can't you wait until you take the dog for a walk and talk about a sunset? Can't you wait? Can't you wait till you get to correct them for the 20th time for not taking over their dish? Can't you wait? 
because that's what it's all about to live your mission. And then there's such a thing as a family mission. Well, I just have to say there was a quote that I'm going to just quote from your book to you right now because it hit me so hard. And it's essentially what you're saying now, but the way it was worded in the book hit me and I want to share it with our sisterhood. The first great mission being a parent incorporates aspects of all eight missions. No other mission involves all eight missions. Being a good parent is the most important and rewarding thing we can do with our lives. Prioritize your missions. Successfully living our primary mission, being a parent, gives us strength to perform other missions as well. And when that was read by you on the audiobook, (laughs) I just thought, amen. Parenting is the great mission. And in a world where you see hashtags like hashtag kids are the worst, you see that kind of stuff and you buy into it. Like I remember for a time thinking, oh, this is the worst. Waking up in the middle of the night is the worst. When I'm sick, you have those moments where you just think, this is not fun. I'm not sleeping well. But then when you think about, can't you wait to all these things that you just listed, all those beautiful things, all those moments that you have with your children are such a blessing. And of course there's moments that are not fun, like there is with anything in life. But when you have that vision of what you are aiming for, that helps put it all into perspective. So you can be excited and not be wishing away their toddler years or their infancy when they're babies and they're not sleeping as well. Enjoy those moments. Cause if you're wishing it away, you think of that country song, Carly and I both could probably start singing in perfect pitch. No, just kidding. The you're going to miss this. You're going to want this back. Yeah. You're going to wish these days hadn't gone by so fast. I think about that song. And anyway, so I'm really excited to talk about the family mission aspect now. Yeah, truly. And as an empty nester, a new empty nester. So our youngest is just left the nest. And I'll tell you what, you really do look back to the golden years. So people say that when they leave, it's the golden years. Not so. It's all those years when they're little that you compare all the rest of the years of your life to. And those are the ones you go back to in the memories and all the family parties and everything else. That is the golden years. And the people who are convinced not to enjoy the golden years, it's a tragedy to me. I just think it is an absolute tragedy. So let's talk about family mission. Not only do you have a personal mission and a parent mission, and maybe even a mission in another capacity at your church, at your work, whatever, but there is also a family mission. So families who have a picture, a vision of who they are going to become They now have to create a plan. How are we going to become that type of family? That's that picture 20 years in the future with those types of relationships, with that type of feeling. How are we going to get there on a daily basis? And in our family, we created a family mission statement that we would say every day. Now, one thing that you want to consider as a family when you're thinking about your mission as a family is, why is your family together? What are you supposed to accomplish? Do you spread joy to other people? Then put it in your mission statement. Are you the type of people who help others? Then put it in your mission statement. Our family, we recognized a long time ago, was a family that was going to help other families, that we needed to spread the idea of mission. And so you will hear in our mission statement, because I'm going to say it for you, you will hear that we talk about living your life's mission. And when a parent lives their mission, then the whole family understands mission. And remember that primary, that number one mission is loving being a parent. So now the whole family sees we all have a purpose because mom has a purpose, because dad has a purpose. This whole group together has a purpose. And Truly, if you think of the first group unit of society that was ever created, it was what? It was a family. That is the first social unit. That Mm -hmm. is the power group. And so if that group can see themselves as a group doing good things, the whole world sees themselves in a whole different light. But this mission statement also helps the family course correct because as we say it each day, the family recognizes, ooh, are we doing that well enough? Do I need to work on that? And you can bring it up to the children on a regular basis as well. So our family mission statement was created on a car ride, okay? 
We were driving to grandma's house. It was a Sunday afternoon going to visit grandma. The children had been raised with skills. We'd been having the skills that are learned in the book and everything. And I realized we needed something to say as a family that would help us maintain our course toward this vision that we created. And so I said, let's make a mission. And so I said, okay, everybody list to me words that you think our family should be and things that we should do in order to become the type of family that we want to be for our vision. And so then we made a list and then me and my husband took that list and we turned it into a statement and then we typed it up all nice and put it on kind of like certificates for the children and presented it to them so that they could have their own copy. And then we memorized it. And we said it every single day after our family prayer and right before our family scripture study when we did our devotion time every single day. So here is the Peck family mission statement. It goes like this. We, the Peck family, will love, support, and be united with one another. We are dedicated to building an atmosphere of trust, faith, and learning in our home. We spread love and happiness to others. We know that we are children of God and endeavor to return to His presence as an eternal family. We have patience and wisdom in our relationships. Heavenly Father guides and loves each of us so that we can fulfill our life's missions. So that's what we would say every single day. So is our family just about each one of us individually? No, we are about a group who does something, who lives missions. We are about a group who trusts in God. We are a group who loves and supports and unites with each other, which means we have to be interdependent, working together as a family. That is who we are intended to be as a group. And we reminded ourselves of that our entire lives. And then as our children married other people and they came into the family, they introduced them to our family vision and to our family mission and then said to their spouses, now we get to come up with our vision and our mission. And guess what? If you don't have any children yet and things are changing a little bit, the mission statement could change a little over time. You could add to it as you recognize, oh, I think we need to have a line about this in it. So it could be a slightly evolving document. Adding a line here and there doesn't hurt. But if you can memorize it, then when your children start fighting with each other, you can say, wait, stop. Do you remember how this morning we said, we, the Peck family, will love, support, and be united with one another? Does this right now feel like love, support, and being united? And then they'll pause and say, mm, no. Okay, then we know we need to correct something, don't we? And then I go into doing a correction and probably correcting someone for not accepting a no answer and somebody else for not disagreeing appropriately. And we fix it and we move on. Thank you for sharing that and sharing your family mission statement. I feel like as you've been talking, I think so much visually about where we're drawing this energy from. Because as we talked about earlier, some mothers feel captive. And I know some listening might feel, even though it seems like a very extreme word, captive, but society does tell us that it is a state that we are locked into for this amount of time and things like that. And it can feel for lack of a better term, overwhelming sometimes when you feel like you're telling me I have to make this and this, but I don't even know how to get like my house in order. Sometimes we can be a little caught up in those things. And I can just sense that maybe there are those that might listen to this and they're excited about it, but maybe a little intimidated. So drawing from what you were talking about, the place that we're drawing that energy from is so much more about the depth and the purpose and it becomes something exciting. And it's also unique. Like that was your family's mission that you had decided together with your spouse. And so we can all have that kind of creativity, which is such a gift from our heavenly father, right? That we can have agency and be able to choose. And we also have this wellspring of ideas and a vision and things that we can come up with. And that family is a place of creativity. And, you know, as you said, create something beautiful or create beauty. I was like, Ooh, that was fun. (laughs) That's pretty fun. But we can choose to feel excited by being the mother and having that role. And like you said, magnifying that role and setting aside time to do that brainstorm with your spouse and maybe start the brainstorm ahead and then bring it together and 
work together. It's such a wonderful thing to do. As you said, families are the building block of society. We have such big impact ultimately. So it's a wonderful position to be in. And thank you for liberating (laughs) so many mothers from feeling those feelings of captivity of what do I do in this situation? I feel a little blocked, but, you know, giving that path forward that they can create with their spouse. There's nothing more fulfilling, Carly, than having a really wonderful bond with your child. There's Mm -hmm. nothing. There is no clean house that can (laughs) compare to that. There is no amount of money you could make. There is no trip you could go on. There is no bonbon you could eat or massage you could have that could ever be as fulfilling as knowing that you are the everything to that child. There really isn't. And the women who spend their whole lives running away from it in the end are empty. But the woman who runs toward it and embraces it finds the ultimate freedom. The ultimate. It is not bondage. It is full, full freedom. And that's what I learned when I really, truly decided that my bucket feeling spot was teaching my children, working with my children, being with my children. That's where my bucket would be filled. You can choose where you're going to fill your bucket. Yeah. Those are all such beautiful points. I think hearing you talk about even just the fact that it's a car ride, it's as simple as having a car ride and having your kids pipe up with, what are words that you think describe our family or the ideals that we want to exhibit in our family, our mission? And you have them start spouting off in a car ride. Because we can all use our car rides a little more effectively, I think. I love that idea of just having your kids spout off some words so that you and your husband can print it up on beautiful paper and help involve the kids and have them recite it later. But to have them feel somewhat involved in the process, depending on their age. I know like Carly mentioned, like her oldest is still four, so they might not have as many worthwhile contributions. But it, you know, no, not that a four-year-old. Rush would have definitely great contribution, Carly. has lots of contributions. <laughs> They'll say fun. We have to have fun. Yes. <laughs> we are a fun family. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I love that idea. Because I think there are great ways that we can embrace the role of motherhood and have that connection with our children and have our hearts knit together with theirs. And I'm grateful for all the love of motherhood that exudes from you when you speak, because it is very refreshing. And I'm thankful that we got to have you on with us today, Nicolene. Is there anything that you would issue to our sisters as a call to action today that you would say, if there's one thing that you would like to have them do, that you would think that would be an important first launching step, what would it be? Do you know what? I actually have something on my website right now called a Calm Parenting Toolkit, and it's free right now. So if you went to teachingselfgovernment.com, right on the homepage, see that there's a Calm Parenting Toolkit. It's a mini course that you could start with. It's a great introductory course for calmness and for understanding a bit more about self-government and some of those skills and going forward there. I just really feel like Calmness is the thing that people struggle with the most. It's the hardest part of your own self-government. If you can get that calm face, voice, and body, no matter what, that changes everything. And obviously there is a lot to learn. When I do three-day intensive trainings for couples, it's 24 hours of training and coaching. I mean, over the three-day period, it's a lot of training, but start small, just go and start with that Calm Parenting Toolkit and then move on from there. Get the help you need. If you've got words that are making it so that you're not proud of yourself afterward, if you're going, wait, I didn't want to be the monster. I didn't want to lay hands on my children. I actually wanted to teach them. That's really what I wanted to do. Then get yourself some new words because we're all robots. We all have been programmed by our parents and other people in society and we've programmed ourselves. And so we can also reprogram ourselves and decide upon language that's going to benefit us and our families. And I would start with calmness. So go to teachingselfgovernment.com and get that Calm Parenting Toolkit because it's a gift for everybody. That's wonderful. I love that as a call to action. And sisters, we'll be sure to include a link to the Calm Parenting Toolkit in our show notes today. So you can be sure to check that out there, as well as links as always to Hey Sister podcast and previous episodes that we've done. So be sure to check out the show notes for links to resources that we've talked about today, as well as our Minute Marker timeline. So we're going to be listing out some of the concepts that Nicolene talked about today. So if you want to return to certain sections, just look for our timeline so that you can jump back to certain Minute Markers if you want to listen to certain aspects again. Nicolene has shared so many wonderful nuggets of information with us. We are sure that you'll want to re-listen to certain sections. So be sure to check out the show notes for that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nicolene. This has been so informative. 
Sisters, we hope you have enjoyed and learned as much as we have today. And if you did, it is your lucky month because as Nicolene mentioned, she has many resources on her website that you can take advantage of. And one of those resources is the ability to reach out to mentors who have received training and have experienced teaching the TSG, Teaching Self-Government Vision and Methods. Teaching Self-Government mentors help parents analyze family relationships and problem-solve difficult situations by teaching principles of self-government, the structure of a unified family atmosphere, and the tools and skills needed for self-mastery, personal freedom, and family unity. We'll be pleased to hear from some of the TSG mentors throughout this month who can further elaborate on some of the ideals mentioned today and specific actions you can take in your home as a mother to better connect with yourself, your children, and your spouse. We will talk to you all next week, sisters. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Can you tell I'm fangirling a little bit here? When you read that uh, on the audio book, when I was listening to you talk to me on the phone the other day, (laughs) you know, last month, I actually feel like I'm talking to my very best friend right now because I've been listening to the audio book throughout the day whenever I have a few minutes. If I send my kids outside, I'll put the audio book in while I'm doing chores around the house. I'm listening to you speak now, Nicolene, and I'm like, I've just been talking to her for months. (laughs) 